Now we get to the important stuff. There's always something to worry about. And, uh, this is the difference. This is what happens in the stock market. Because, see, everybody's got the brain power to do well in the stock market. The question is whether you have the stomach for it. That's the key organ in the body. There's always something to worry about. I grew up, I went to school, grew up as a kid in the 50s. In the decade of the 50s, there's this is big theory that the depression was caused by a stock market crash. Totally wrong. Less than 1% of Americans owned stocks in 29. We had this big time recession. In fact, it was a depression. That's what, it wasn't caused by the stock market. We, the economy went down, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, and we had a big time depression. In fact, we had several depressions like that from 1850 on. We had, this was only one of about eight depressions since 1850. But people, in the, people thought the only reason we got out of the depression was World War II, and they said, once we get back, next time we have a recession, we're gonna have a depression. And it's gonna be a great depression. I never understood that adjective in front of depression. It ought to be crummy depression or bad depression, but it was a great depression. I never quite, quite understood that one. The, uh, so people weren't buying stocks in the 50s because they thought that another Great Depression was going to happen. In addition, people were very scared about nuclear warheads and nuclear war in the 50s. People were building fallout shelters, stocking with canned goods. And there's something about going to Vermont, building a fallout shelter, putting canned goods in it, that you don't buy Minnesota mining or you don't buy East Dakota. I mean, just the syllogism just doesn't work out that you're buying uh, lots of water, buying a shotgun, buying frozen food that, that will stay in the freezer with it, your own generator, and you're looking at growth stocks. <laughs> Doesn't seem to work out that way, you know. And I remember in the 50s, I mean, I remember literally in classes, I was in elementary school in the 50s, and they'd come in, they'd have one of these air raid drills, somebody would yell a hat would come in, they'd blow a whistle, and you'd get under your desk. Even then I said, I don't think this is gonna do a lot of good, you know. At the, <laughs> the, uh, but people are worried about a depression in nuclear war in the 50s. And then, they, I mean, the, the warheads, they couldn't do much damage back in the 50s. Now one of these Stan countries, you know these Kakistan and Kazakhstan, all these Stan guys that have spun off these, these Friedman building spin-offs from the Soviet Union, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, they didn't lead it. There was a co-deal with somebody else, like Goldman Sachs, and they're uh, they, they on the left side, though. The, uh, uh, every one of these little countries has enough warheads to blow the world up 88 times. I mean, who's built a fallout shelter lately? You know, we stop worrying about it. I mean, there's always something to worry about in the 50s, it was depression and nuclear war. The 50s was the best decade this century for the stock market, except for the 80s. Only slightly better. The 80s only slightly better. People didn't expect a lot. We had an okay, it wasn't a great uh, decade. They just didn't expect much. We made it through. And the uh, stock market was terrific. Uh, do you remember when oil went from 4 to 40? Remember that, remember that period? Oil went from 4 to 40, and the experts said it was going to go to 100, and all the countries of the world were going to go bankrupt. And then and the big banks go bankrupt, and we're going to have a Great Depression, and the stock markets go down, and you're going to wind up selling pencils and apples. You know, the, uh, well, I remember when oil went from 4 to 40, and the experts said it was going to go to 100. Within two years, oil was at 14. The experts, now much higher paid at this point, are saying it's going to go to 4, and we're going to have a depression. <laughs> and people believe it again. You know, the, uh, I remember when the money supply was growing too fast, and they said we're going to have a depression, then it was growing too slow, we're going to have a depression. Remember the LDC debt? Remember the LDC debt, all the banks? Our banks are very smart. They lent all their net worth to Zimbabwe and Botswana and Botswana and all these countries, Chile, a lot of countries they can't pronounce. This is Chase Manhattan and Chemical and Manufacturers Hanover. These countries weren't doing so well. Then they were called undeveloped countries or less developed countries. Now you have to call them emerging countries. It's not politically correct to call anybody an undeveloped country. It's like I just found out the other day that the term for somebody that's overweight is laterally challenged. You have to say something <laughs> laterally challenged. The, but these are LDC debt. They're all going to go bankrupt, and we're going to have a depression. Uh, then the Mideast was going to own the world. Remember that one? The Mideast was going to own the world. They weren't going to buy our bonds. And the market crashed, and we're going to have a depression. Then Japan was going to own the world. Remember that one? Japan was going to have all the assets, and they weren't going to buy our bonds, and we're going to have a depression. Within three years, the Nikkei Dow had gone from 40,000 to 16,000. The banking system was in trouble. And people said Japan was going to collapse and we're going to have a depression. <laughs> I mean, people had, on their prayer list, at the end of the day, they had eliminated crippled children and Mother Teresa, they're praying for Japan. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a country with a 15% savings rate, you know, it's some bizarre, you know. Commercial real estate, global warming, uh, you know. And I think it's the older you get, the more nervous you get about these things. I think it's very viable, I think while younger people are better investors, is they're not worried, they haven't heard about all these crises. And they're with children. I think if you don't have any kids, you ought to rent some kids for the weekend. You know, 
get a seven-year-old and ask him if he knows about the money supply, you know, how fast it's growing. <laughs> ask him if he knows about the shape of the yield curve is the wrong shape of the yield curve. Or that we're 48.3 months into the economic recovery and the average recovery is last 52.3 months. You know, ask an eight-year-old if they know about that. Eight-year-olds have a very high expectation about the next 20 years. That's what you need to do. The more you get away from eight-year-olds, the more you get away from 11-year-olds, the more you start reading these crazy things you read over the weekend. The, uh, in fact, from 1955 to 1985, the stock market uh, went up a grand total of 1,000 points, but it was down 800 on Mondays. So it was, down, it was therefore up 1,800 on non-Mondays. It wasn't an accident. The stock market went down October the 19th, 87, was a Monday. People over the weekend become economists and portfolio strategists. You know. <laughs> I'm there a bull if they take their lunch on the way to work. You know, to the, in fact, I knew very well the market was going to go down in October of 1987. Uh, Dave Elson remembers that. It was my first vacation. It was going to take in six years. And we decided to go to Ireland and uh, we stayed at all these little cottages and play golf. And I left on Thursday after the close of the trade. The market was down 55 points, which wasn't a good start, but it was down 55 points. And we got over there, and because of the time zone, we were able to do what we wanted to do and get down to Cork and called in. The market was down about 118. And I said to Carolyn, if the market goes down on Monday, we better go back. But we're already here, so uh, I was going to stay for the weekend. So as you know, the market went down uh, 508 on Monday, so I flew home because my fund had gone, from, I think, from 13 billion to 9 billion in two working days. And I, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, the trend here is not positive. Like, I could do something about it, you know. You know. The, uh, but there's something when they called, they wanted to say, well, what's Lynch doing right now? Well, he's on the 10th hole. He's even part of the front nine, but you know. He's in a trap right now. This could be a double bogey. This could be a quadruple bogey right here. Could, could blow the entire front nine right here. You know, this is not what they wanted to hear, you know. It, uh, uh, so I have no idea when the market's gonna go down and uh, no idea when it's gonna go up. I'm totally shocked the market was 4,000 two and a half years ago. A little while ago, it's 8,000. Uh, I had no idea about this. Uh, very surprising to me. But I'll guarantee you, the market will be a lot higher in 15 years. It'll be a lot higher in 25 years. What it's going to do in the next one or two years, I don't have any idea. And if somebody in this room knows about it, they're not telling anybody. <laughs> or they're not in this room. They're down in Palm Springs somewhere. You know, the, they've made a billion dollars. Or if they know anything about interest rates. Because in interest rates, if you can be right five times in a row in 10 grand, you can have two billion. It's not that many people with two billion. There's a lot of people predicting interest rates. Did you ever think about that one? <laughs> the, uh, just five times right in a row in 10 grand, two billion. It, uh, if you write seven times in a row, you can have the GNP of, uh, you know, the United Kingdom. You know, it's a big number. It, uh, uh, so I don't worry about that. I know we've had uh, 96 years of century, and the market's fallen 53 times. We've had 53 declines of 10% or more. So 53 declines in 96 years. Once every two years, we have a 10% decline. Of the 53 declines, 15, one five, have been 25% or more. So 15 and 96 years, about once every six years, the market falls 25% or more. That's what we call a bear market, you know, you know that. And it's gonna happen. It's, I don't care when it's gonna happen. I would love to know. I, obviously, it would be very useful to know when it's gonna happen. It doesn't make a difference to me. Corporate profits will be a lot higher eight years from now, a lot higher 16 years from now, a lot higher 30 years from now. That's what I deal with. And I'll be glad to answer your questions. It's been great, uh, enjoyed it, and uh, I wanna start the questions. They don't get the question. I'll read the calendar of offerings for Friedman Billings for the next month. <laughs> okay. Do you like international stocks? The uh, uh, question is, I always, I found I was better overseas than I was domestic because there's just less coverage. There's less people following these companies. So I think my big theory, and I think it's valid, if you look at 10 companies, you'll find one that's mispriced. If you look at 20, you'll find two. If you look at 100, you'll find 10. The person that turns over the most rocks wins the game. Overseas, the numbers are much better. There's just not that much coverage. So I think international stocks are definitely worth looking at. When do you sell stocks? When you sell a stock is exactly the reason you buy it. You write down the reason you bought it. I bought Subaru. Subaru was a distributor. They didn't, they didn't, make any, they didn't actually make the cars. I think it was Fuji Heavy Industries made the cars. They distributed uh, Subarus in the United States. 
The stock was, uh, I think the stock was 80. It was up from 6 to 80. I was a little late on this, but I didn't bother me, and I should never let that bother you. I didn't let it bother me. They had $40 a share in cash. They had a very low-priced car. It was well-liked. And it did well for about five or six years, and I think the stock went from 80 to 320. But the reason I sold Subaru, thank you. The reason I sold Subaru is Hyundai came in with a low-cost car. Chrysler cut the, cut the price of Omni Horizon. Ford came out with a low-priced car at the end. All of a sudden, the Subaru was no longer unique. If the, if the car's not a buy, the stock's not a buy. That's what you're looking for. The reason you buy a stock, you keep it posted. If the reason changes, you go on to something else.